Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Christian Bacasa. This week, we've got Adam Omernick on the line. Adam, it's great to have you on the show. You've got quite the history in fly fishing. You've been, uh, you know, fly fishing and um, in the industry for 15, 20 years now. Uh, you did some guiding for several years. You have had multiple businesses in the uh, industry and space. Um, but not only that, you taught these really cool um, kind of introductory camps and uh, fishing lessons in the park at an early stage of your career that were really unique. You've done casting competitions and you're casting certified, et cetera. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this because I personally have never had a casting lesson uh, myself. I know I need one. I think everybody does. Um but I know I definitely need one because <laughs> I could get better. Uh, and, you know, we're going to talk about that today. So the meat of our show is really going to be around casting, but not only casting and casting in multiple water situations. So we're going to break down each kind of like water type, at least a few of them, and talk through the various casting techniques and then summarize that with what the commonalities are. Uh, so, again, that's going to be a pretty interesting subject. And then the wrap up on the show we're going to go through um, some of the continuous learning uh, techniques that you've used um, in your career, et cetera, to really keep things, one, A, interesting, and B, keep yourself going. So, yeah, Adam, great great to have you on the show, and uh, let's get rolling here, man. How you been? I'm good. I'm happy to be here. We just got back from the San Juan a couple weekends ago, and I'm looking mm. forward to heading to Montana for another trip. So uh, ready for that Lake of the Giants trip. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. You're uh, San Juan. You were wrestling pigs down there, I bet. Oh, yeah. We're chasing around the, the big fish in Texas Hole, and uh, the river was running high, but it's kind of funny because the uh, San Juan on high – is like floating the Colorado on low. So everybody right. was telling us they were all timid. And I was like, these aren't even real rapids. Yeah. <laughs> so, right, right. And yep. the fishing is always seems to be pretty good when it's high. It's like yeah. it flushes the river and really gets the, the aquatic insect and worms and et cetera that they're known for kind of churned up and feeding. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. They were taking the San Juan worm, so it was kind of funny to be able to fish that one, and I was throwing a two-fly rig, and that's all they were still taking, so I yeah. guess born and bred there. <laughs> I remember years ago, um, I had met a guy that fished that water quite a bit, and um, one of the uh, legalities of the fly fishing is if you have a hook, it has to have thread on it. It has to have something on it. Mm -hmm. Because people were just fishing a small red anodized hook and having really good success. And he was one of those guys that was like, yeah, I just take the anodized hook and I put a little <laughs> bit of a uh, whip finish on it and I'm off to the races, you know. And I'm like, okay, it's your style, right? He's getting dirty. Yeah. I can see that one working. <laughs> yeah, and he was like, I'm just crushing up, man. Christian, it's just like unbelievable. So that was pretty neat to hear, hear, hear his creativity in, in some ways, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so let's do this. Let's jump into the the uh, casting scenario um, and talk about – maybe let's start out with, like, small creeks, right? What are some of the faux pas? What are some of the good techniques, bad techniques, et cetera, and, and walk through that? Uh, a lot of times when I see people starting in small creeks, they go with – a short rod to be able to navigate the bushes and stuff like that. Um, one of the things that I didn't like about short rods and why I started to fish small creeks with Tenkara rods or a longer rod is the line management mm -hmm. is, you know, a lot of times when you're fishing those small creeks, like I love dry dropper, if I can cut that dropper off and just fish dry, but then it's even more important to have that line management and no drag on your fly. You know, usually it's that initial hit on the water when it's, they're going to take it. Yep. So, um, that longer rod, if you can navigate that in those smaller creeks, gives you that opportunity to keep that line off the water and really do that drop in it, um, you know, from the, uh, from a higher position and keeping that line off the water. Um, What's your perspective on leader length for small creeks with a longer rod? Because I've heard both ways. Some guys say, well, I like a shorter leader so I can have more line out and get a shorter cast, right? Because it's tight. 
But then mm-hmm. I say, hear guys say, oh, I like a longer leader because it's, you know, I want it to be a little more camouflaged or et cetera. I'm on the other end of the short side in small creeks. But yeah. I'm curious to hear what you, what your perspective is. Yeah. My pretty standard setup is a seven and a half foot four X leader. And I always told my clients two feet, a tippet, a foot, like shoulder width apart. That way, one, I always kind of know what I'm pulling off my spool. So I have that consistency of this much. And I like the seven and a half because the whole point of a fly rod is to have fly line out of the tip of the right. rod to be able to cast. Right. So that seven and a half foot leader um, allows you to get a little more fly right, fly line off the ro- uh, out of the rod tip. Um, I liked uh, when I would do it, I had a... Th- like eight foot three weight that I would do, but I would upsize the line one so I could get a little extra oomph out of my cast. Mm-hmm. But I pretty much always run that seven and a half foot. Yeah. Okay. Leader. Yeah. And I, I, I'm in the same group as you. I like to have the line because if I'm in tight spaces, I want to be able to load as much as possible. And with whether that's over lining the rod, which nowadays mm-hmm. a lot of times you don't have to do because the lines are already overlined. Mm-hmm. Um, the industry's just changed there. But, um, and that really facilitates like those other casts, like those roll casts and things mm-hmm. like that in tight water. So let's talk about the actual task of casting and some of those techniques that you like to utilize and what's important, you find important. Uh, always the, the bow and arrow cast. Cause once again, it's always just getting, and I, tell people to flip it so the fly is up he- on the top. I've seen mm. a lot of people try to flip it like that on a bow and arrow. Yep. The problem is is the fly is just going towards the water down. If you do it from the top, it lays over like a roll cast a little more. Okay. Uh, I, I also like a roll cast. I don't know how many people like to – I mean, it feels good to throw the fly in the air, okay. but – just a simple drag it through the water so it kind of loads and give it a little flick over. Uh-huh. I mean, a, a lot of people tend to pull more line out the, than they need because that's what the videos show. That's what it, you know, everything kind of teaches us. But leave the line on the reel, manage it with your finger, and just kind of pick those pockets with quickly. your roll cast. Yeah, just kind of roll cast it in. And I'm a very fast fisherman like i'm confident in flies i mean i fish royal wolves i feel simulators uh putter buck caddis is probably my go-to in the small water if they haven't hit it in three or four casts like i've either spooked them they're not interested there's a fish somewhere upstream that's gonna take that so right right so i i'm a three or four cast guy i don't like sitting in the holes um and just picking that water apart Let's talk about your roll cast a little bit, because that is a, such a critical cast in small water, but it could be utilized anywhere. Um, when you say keeping the line on the water, give us a few ideas of what you mean from the line management side. And then I would like to hear your perspective on um, redirection of that cast, because it's not a, a cast that's really designed to redirect at a hard angle. It can be micromanage, but maybe some of the tips and, and techniques on how to, to move your position. You need to think of a roll cast. And when I would teach this in my classes, you got to think of it as a, as a, a train track. So your fly is on one side of the track and your rod is on the other side of the track. So you can't have them cross. Hmm. So if your fly is on the right, you can cast anywhere from fly left. Gotcha. But you can't cast to the right because you're going to cross, you're going to get that knot, it's going to wrap the tip of the rod, and you're going to waste precious fishing time untangling your your rod. Mm-hmm. So just think about it. The fly, if you drag your rod to the right, you keep that cast where you come over your shoulder, but you can change directions. You can bring it up, drag it through the water, and then throw 90 degrees just as long as you're not casting the line. And I think a lot of people forget that you can bring your rod across your body. Mm-hmm. So just drag that fly up your left side, and then you can cast to your right. So I do a lot of cross body, a lot of cross body casting. It doesn't matter if I'm on the left side of the river, the right side of the river, where I'm going upstream, I can manage it. So if you take that time to be able to understand where your rod tip is, 
you really can utilize that cast more. Also, make sure your rod tip is up in the air and that line is dangling behind you. Because okay. a lot of people do the, the roll cast in a like a fluid motion. Right. But that doesn't give the D loop chance to form behind you. Okay, that was what so, I was going to question is, is that why? It's getting that D loop. And it also sounds like you're talking about when you're changing direction, changing your anchor point as well in orientation to the tip. So maybe describe that in a little more detail so people can understand those two concepts. Be careful you don't pick your fly up off the water like going too fast backwards because mm. then that's very true. The anchor point is gone because you need something touching water. Fly, leader, preferably line, mm -hmm. but you need to leave it. So I tend to do really slow back to set up my D, I bring my rod tip up, and then I would tell my students, you can pause there forever because you're now set up for the cast. Then you can do your cast. And your but cast you is, uh, is it like a hammer down? Technically, you, how would you describe that? Uh, I do. You definitely have to give it more oomph, but a lot of people forget to do that stop so that the rod unloads. And goes. A lot of people will bring that rod all the way parallel to the river, but then when your loop unrolls, it's going to unroll into the water. Okay. Ideally, you want your D loop to go above the water and lay out down. So you're fly stopping last. your rod tip at that like, so your rods at that like thirty to forty five degree angle high. Actually, yes. Okay. Yeah. Like a like I and I stop mine pretty high. I probably stop mine at one o'clock or two o'clock. Okay. You know, and then and then slowly bring it down. Like mm -hmm. I would that's what I would tell my students. Follow the rod tip down. Stop. Follow it down. Because mm -hmm. then hopefully your line is straight out. The problem is a lot of people stop it, it drops to the water, then they drop the rod tip, and then there's a pile of line. So right. you already have drag <laughs> before you've even started. Right, 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 right. That's a great uh, way to describe it. You are, it's a very um in my opinion, it looks like a really fluid cast when you're very, your timing is right, like anything, mm -hmm. right? Yes. But you can break that into like three components and have a, an extremely effective cast. Yes. Um, and then over time, refine that into that more fluid motion. And I, I would recommend if you haven't um, fished wet flies downstream. Go that do is, that mm. <laughs> for a session, and your roll cast will get so good. Just find a seam and pick the seam apart. Okay, I'm going to go on the left side of the seam, a little closer, down the seam, right side of the seam. Okay, you know, and fan that, and then take 10 steps down river, do it again, you know. And boy, your roll cast will improve, like, significantly, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I was just listening to one of your episodes and the guy talked about wet fly swing, and you guys were talking about it. And that's a technique that I have never put any time into i just, i don't have any confidence but i was like i really need to take take that i'm like dragging it under that stump right yeah. that your dry your dry fly is not going to get your nymph's not going to get down there fast enough when you throw like indicator so i was like all right so that's uh, something i need to add to my yeah. repertoire that's awesome to hear <laughs> that's awesome to hear. yeah go give it a try man and, I, and you know what i really like about that technique and fishing downstream is Fishing downstream is it's hard because you know you, the visibility mm. side and et cetera, et cetera, and you got current working mm. kind of almost against you in some ways. Yeah. Um, but on a swing, those are all advantageous to you. And um, like you said, you can position your line really far downstream, still have great contact because you got a, a straight tip and the line straight and everything else and. Yeah, it's really fun. I, I love I love fishing wet flies. It's some older guys when I first started taught me how to do that and I just thought it was awesome. The take feels really good and it was very effective. So yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm I looking mean, forward worked, to hearing how you uh, how you do with that for sure. Yeah. I would do it with streamers. Why would you not do it with a nymph or something that right. would you know be taken? So Yeah, yeah, cool. Cool. All right, so let's talk about the next kind of stage up in water class. And that's like your standard river, not a real big spay river per se, but a, a standard mm. river, western river, uh, eastern river that you would go fish that, you know, 
has good water flow, et cetera, not tighten the bushes. You got some casting mm-hmm. room, go from there. Yeah, I think of the big Thompson in Loveland. That's where I learned to fly fish and up in Rocky Mountain National Park. The Pooter, the St. Vrain, Boulder mm-hmm. Creek, like all that stuff is that standard Colorado water. Um, uh, the first thing that I would say when you're casting is don't forget the shore. Don't step where you want to fish. I Just a ton of people just walk out to – I was on Gray Reef one time, and we were fishing on a boat, but we saw trichos hatching and saw noses, so we pulled the boat over. And we were throwing trichos to this, to a uh, hatch, basically. Yeah. I watched a guy walk through the water with his indicator <laughs> and his worm on the line. He walked through our rising trout <laughs> to throw his indicator because, by God, that's what he wanted to throw. Right. Um, but he didn't take that moment. If he'd have stopped and just looked at the water and looked close to him, he could have stopped. He easily could have thrown with us, dry, trico dries. Yeah. And it wouldn't have interrupted anything, but he put the fish down because he was set on that. That's the hole I fish, and this is the way I fish. Right. So, so don't step on your fish when you first when you first reach the river. It's really. I don't know how many ones. Yeah, I don't know how many I've stepped on or spooked or. Well, that's they're here, and I didn't get my opportunity for for them. Um. But on those rivers, I really use a fan technique. So I tend to fish close to shore. My next cast is over. And like I said, I'm, once again, I'm a four to six cast guy. So I'm that was really close. I did about six inches a foot to my left, six inch foot to my left, six inch foot to my left. And I really break the water up that. So when I'm – since I, I kind of learned and taught myself in pocket water – that's how I look at rivers okay. is each each individual pool as one little spot. So if you give me more space on that, I'm just going to break that up left side of the rock, right side of the rock, in front of the rock, behind the rock. Yeah. Okay. You know, and, and looking for that different structure. But once again, it's that line management. Just because you're on a bigger river doesn't mean you need to pull out that 10 foot of fly line dangling at your feet and then... You know, when you do that cast, um, bring the line back. Like as you're drifting in, you can always just pull line in so that you can keep that tight line connection. Right. Because a lot of people will throw it in there and then just leave water on the line, on the thing, which you can mend it, which is fine. But to set the hook, you need to pull all that mended line up out of the water to make that connection point. So if you can slowly strip it in. You you have less stuff that you have to take into account when you're thinking about microcurrents and drifts and all that. Like if I could just leave just my fly and hold my rod tip way up in the air. <laughs> that's your that's ideal, right? Do. You know, I mean, that's less ideal. Drag. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Also, when you're fishing indicators, fish your indicator like you would a dry fly. Yes. Like. If that thing is dragging, if that thing is not doing natural stuff, your flies are not in the zone. So I think people think, well, I've got weight, I've got flies, it's all down there. Well, the second that thing starts to drag, your flies raise the water column, you've lost your your drift that you tried so hard to get those flies down into the zone. Yeah, and I think a misconception too, especially I recall it as a beginner, um, when you're fishing an indicator – I always was like, oh, I don't want to move that indicator. Then I'm jostling my flies around. And that it's really the opposite of like, yeah, I want to fish it like a dry fly. I want to get a good drift. But if that thing is pooling everything else, it's okay to lift it and let those flies drop again into the column. Mm-hmm. And don't be afraid of that because um, it, it is a misconception. I'm going to do this too, Adam. I think this is going to be a value to our <laughs> listeners. Um, <laughs> I'm going to get my dogs to stop barking. <laughs> they're, they're excited. So, um, it, but the reality is like, well, give me one second. Here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh gosh. Go. I think it's the uh, UPS guy. Here. Yep. I'll give it a second. I'm going to write this time down. Cause I'll be able to cut this up. Yeah. No worries. Okay, here we go. 
So, um, wh- I think this is going to be a value for our listeners. I'm going to break down the, the approach that you took in comparison to the approach that I take. And we'll talk about some of the variabilities here. Does that sound good? Mm-hmm. So yeah, sounds good. you mentioned walking up to the water. I, I fully agree. I, I used to do that. I had in mind, I'm limited on time. I want to get to the river. I know there's fish in this hole. I would walk up. I'd go to the hole where I had success. I'd walk right in the water. And then I started getting away from that. So one of the things that I have changed in my approach to water now is I actually start back away from the bank. And I fish a little down river. So I fish just as much as I can by observation down river and in front of me before I really approach the bank. And the reason I do that is because I was up on a small creek here in Utah. And I noticed one day I came in this pool. I could see the fish rising and I could see them moving. It was crystal clear. And I fished directly in front of me at the bank and I didn't, I didn't get, catch anything. I missed them. But then I walked up to the bank and I noticed I spooked the fish below me and they ran up and they scooted everything out. And so ever since then, I've had that like just imagination of, Oh gosh, I don't want to spook everything in this hole again. You know? So I, I use that technique. So I, I wholeheartedly agree. You got to fish the water close to you, get it, get it set before you walk up and, and spook everything. The next, you talked about your fanning left to right. I've talked about this in my tips section too. I I fan left to right too, but sometimes what I'll do is I'll I'll bounce from side to side, and I'll really make sure that I don't disrupt the water between. And the reason I like to do that is I call it new water, right? So if I'm moving six inches apart, a fish will move six inches at times. To go mm-hmm. to eat, mm-hmm. and a splash will resonate six to eighteen inches, right? So the way I look at it is, if I fish here and then I fish to the other side, but I manage my line, I'm not disrupting that water between, and so every cast is like new water again, right? They've had time to reset, um, but at the same time, if the currents don't allow that for me to keep that line, manage it, or that splash, etc. I do the same thing. You break in your water down, like you said, in front of the wall, rock, to the side, behind, to the side, et cetera, et cetera. So I really like the way that you described that. Um, and then the yeah. last is your approach to um, uh, the cast in length. When I first started, again, I thought, okay, bigger water, bigger cast. And it's not it. I remember I went out with a friend of mine, really good um, guide. He just took me out as a friend. And then he said, look, knock it off with the long cast, buddy. He's like, <laughs> he's like, you can cast. Okay. We got it. He's like, tune it down. He's like, the fish are right there. You know? Uh-huh. And, it, and it was like, sure enough. Like I started just slowing it down and casting shorter, more like leader on the water, less line on the water, better drifts. Mm. And we were fishing really small, little like 22 midges and things. And, um, yeah, it, it makes a big difference. You don't need that cast. The cast is a, it's a, it's a tool, but it's a specialty tool that should only be taken out when it's really needed is the way I kind of look at it, right? You think about how many people can with a very raw cast, but short, can be extremely effective. Um, yeah, now, well, there are certain situations where a long cast is needed, but for trout water, in a lot of cases, the shorter the better, I, I think. What's your perspective? Yeah, I mean, that's just it. I mean, as I teach my friends um, and we go out more, um, just the line management, like rod tip down so that you can set the hook, like the less the less you have to screw around with, right? We're already walking through slick water. We've already got mm-hmm. waders and you can't see. And, you know, you already got a million things you're trying to keep your mind on, let alone your line, your leader, your drags. Um, and I think a lot of people don't take that time to learn. Um, when mm-hmm. I was doing my casting certification, um, one of the things you have to do is a reach mend where you cast yeah. it upstream and then drop your rod tip and reach mend upstream, reach mend downstream, S mends. Yep. Like that's each cast or each different mend that you put in your quiver. Like, I mean, I've, I took a summer and 
I mean, that's that's how I advance my stuff. Is each each summer I try to learn something new. And one summer was casting, and I did. I took frisbees out to the park, and I really target practiced and really tried to get timed in on that one. I worked on distance casting and you know my men's and doing S men's and all that stuff because that's the great part about the water right. as you hike upstream, right? Is like, well, now this current's fast out there and trying to show my friends that like, you know, I'd show them how to mend and the water would be fast on the outside, not on the inside. Mm -hmm. Well, then we'd walk upstream. Also, the water's fast on the inside and they're still doing the same mend. And you're like, no, 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 no. no. A mend yeah, is a technique. Like... <laughs> a mend yeah. is a technique, but it's, it's facilitated differently based on the currents. And, yeah. and I love we... how you talked about the mends too, because so let's talk about those different different casts: an S men, mm -hmm. a wiggle cast, mm -hmm. a curved mm -hmm. cast, and a reach cast. We mm -hmm. call them casts. We call them men's. Um, but there's there's a difference there. A wiggle cast and a reach cast. That's an aerial mend, mm -hmm. right? So you're yes. mending your line before it makes contact with the water. Yeah. Same with a, a curve cast. It's an aerial men by overpowering your cast to one side. So learning that is totally different than what most people understand as a men because they learn a men from fishing in an indicator where mm -hmm. you cast your indicator in line or on the water and then you mend your line from the water. That's not an aerial men. That's a water loaded or water based men. So really understanding that technique. I mean, it, it's a world of a difference, especially in my opinion, in small creeks. When you start yeah. to learn how to use a wiggle cast or a curve cast, you can open up the water to so many more opportunities. Yeah, there's a lot of times on those small creeks that I can cast across them. And you can't wait across, so those fish haven't seen a fly in a long time. But if I do that reach cast or I mend, do a really big aerial mend, my my hopper on the other side has got three seconds of uninterrupted drift before that line catches that current, mm -hmm. and I'm getting takes yep. on them. Yep. So, yeah, the the mends really make a big a big difference, and reading that that water and understanding which situation. I mean, I got to the point when I was really practicing my casting where I could put an amend, an aerial mend in different points in the line. Like if mm. I wanted my mend to close, you do your mend quickly as soon as you stop your rod. Right. If you cast and then you wait and then you do your mend, it's out your the mend fly. will end up the fly. So yeah. You can get just as technical with the, your aerial mens as you can learning new casts or hauling or double hauling or any of the stuff that you can add to your, your casting. Yeah, that's great. You know, I'll, I'll throw in there um, a great resource for learning how to do those aerial, ca uh, aerial mens and different cast techniques is um, on YouTube. There's a, uh, I think he's Australian or, or something. It's called Bumcast. That's actually where I learned a lot of my techniques. <laughs> and too. I used to cast with his bright red right. like line. I still have that on one of my reels if I'm showing somebody techniques. Like he's it's such a pretty videos and just such oh, yeah. excellent casting. He's a great instructor. Yeah, he's a his description of the cast and understanding of them is really fantastic. And then like you said, the scenery is like I mean, the most incredible looking water you'll you'll be able to experience. And then he has this bright yellow and red line that shows you all the movement in the lines. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a bum cast. It's on YouTube. Um, yeah, it's really, I think, a great, great starting point. And then go get a casting instructor. I think that's worth it. I'm going to I'm going to do that this year. That's my big summer adventures uh, or investment, I should say, in myself is I'm going to get a casting instructor. Yeah, his movie Once in a Blue Moon made uh, New Zealand my bucket list for mousing on a for brown trout. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he's a pretty talented guy with a with a rod for sure. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we've covered small creeks, regular style rivers, etc. I want to talk about um, a different rod technique, bigger river, and that's spay casting. And then we're going to jump into some saltwater stuff because that's a whole nother world. 
Um, mm-hmm. So let, let's talk about the spay thing. Even this is another world too, but some of the same techniques uh, that we were talking about, which is like a roll cast example. Yeah. One of the things that really helped me with my roll cast, I mean, spay rods are nice, but the average person doesn't need that kind of technique in that, but you can add that into your cast. Simon Galsworth has a book, uh, Double Hand Cast for a Single Hand Rod, mm. where you can actually learn all of those, you know, the snap T, the circle C, the, um, gosh, I can't even remember the, yeah, the names the names, of them, right. the, all the names, the snake but you can, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. But you can do a snap T with a single hand rod because once again, like your roll cast, you're you're giving your anchor point a different thing. So a lot of the times when I'm fishing out of my boat, my flight craft, I'll drag it upstream and then I'll do that overhand so that I can roll cast. Because a lot of times when we're fishing from drift boat, right, we're doing indicators, weights, a lot of heavy stuff. I'm always telling my friends, please don't put that up in the air. Yeah. <laughs> because it's – you're exactly right. I mean, <laughs> when you're going a boat, um, you, it's like being on a bank sometimes, right? Imagine the edge of the boat mm-hmm. being the bank with bushes behind you. Well, you got your mm-hmm. body behind you with his rod and you don't want to, or you got a guide behind you um, that's on a platform or whatever. So a lot of times those techniques work really well. And um, that was an eye opener for me too. I did some swinging um, on a spay rod up in Alaska and I realized, oh man, I just, I don't have the technique. I can't get it out there. And when I came back and I started practicing them a little bit, I started with a single hand rod. And um, mm-hmm. the one of the things that helped me, and I'll ask your opinion on this, but I thought it really, I like overlined it by like three or four lines weights. Yeah. Just so I could get it to load real easy and start to feel it. Have you tried that? Or is that the technique that you use when you're teaching? Or I've done overlining. Um, if you want to do more roll casting, you can also do a double taper line, which, I mean, they don't really do those as common. Wait for it is all the all the rage, I guess, yeah. nowadays. But the the double taper, because then you've got your heavier end on in the rod, too. So that also works better for, okay. for roll casting, too. But overlining helps. But a lot of it is, I mean, the rod, a five-weight line for a five-weight rod is pretty well matched. And as long as you have enough line out of the rod tip like i love the real lines that have the transition point from the head into the next part of the line Uh so as long as that's past the rod tip that should load pretty good okay but and then making sure that once again that anchor point stays on the water so that you can really drag it drag it up and then that stop so that line dangles behind you. That's yeah. a lot of people when they're doing roll casts, they're not giving that line a big enough D, the the loop of the D. Mm-hmm. They're not giving that time to form on that. So, but you can drag, I would tell my students, drag the, the rod like in a circle so you can keep your rod tip low, but then pick up your rod tip here. Then your line's dangling then you can do your cast. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So dragging it around and managing your line and then thinking about where your indicator, where your line is before, make sure it's drifted past you so you can do your cast and you're not crossing your railroad tracks. Yep. Okay. And then do you find too that that those spay casts and roll, you know, different styles, um, much better to practice on a body of water than on grass or in a park because it seems like you just can't get that um that vacuum on the line to load the rod etc if you're gonna do roll casting on the grass you have to throw a giant d loop behind you to have enough to go and it i i can do it but it's very quick you got to have a lot of line behind you and really like you have to do a continuous men- momentum, but you got to do it. Um, in one of the books I read about spay casting, they, they do a grass leader. So you mm. tie a leader, but then you like tie like a, a knot, but leave the tag end so it grips grass. Gotcha. So when I was practicing my spay casts, I built a couple grass leaders oh, cool. to be able to do it. But ultimately you want you want water, water for, right. the roll, for the roll for the for the roll cast. That's a great idea, though. I mean, if you you know, we don't all have access and time to water right down the road, right? Mm-hmm. but I might have mm-hmm. a, a park. Um, mm-hmm. So grass leader. So there's a, there's a tip for you right there. 
I like it. Mm. Tie a couple blood knots in it, leave some big tags or something. Use your old mm-hmm. leaders. Something that's going to create uh, friction, essentially, right? And allow you to load the rod. That's what you're attempting to do. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Trying to get that grip, that resistance, that anchor point that you need to be able to throw that cast. Also, remember, a lot of spay rods, I mean, the one I was practicing with was a 13-foot rod. Hmm. So spay rods are definitely longer. They have a lot more whip. You know, you can put your second hand under the reel and kind of use it as a balance point and get that little flick yeah. that they that they do with the spay. The pull so, versus just the push. Yeah. what you're referring to, right? I also liked it for... Uh, when I when you go to set the hook, like once again in the boat and with the indicator, I like that roll cast and the thought process of that. So I set the hook, everything comes out of the water towards my face. I do a circle cast and I just put it back in the water. Mm. So I'm just using that to continue my cast. Mm-hmm. It went up in the air, but I'm using the momentum and still thinking about that in a in line. Let's talk about that two handed scenario you just talked about. Um you have that lower part of the rod for the flick, but mm-hmm. are you also utilizing that for your stop as well? How, how, maybe kind of talk about your technique with your hands. Cause it's kind of like this push pull scenario, right? To, mm-hmm. to, to get energy into the rod, but are you also kind of like stomping to get that rod tip to stop and, and shoot line? Or I, I'm curious to hear how you teach that. Uh, for a lot of times, it's more of the the pull back and then just a little little bit of flick okay. with it. I I try not to utilize too much because you don't want to drop the rod tip down once again towards the water. You want to be able to stop high. Okay. But the problem with wrists too is a lot of people get very wristy in their cast. But then you open your your arc or your rod. So most people, I call it the rainbow cast, because when you do the wrist, it's, you know, you go 180 degrees Mm -hmm. and it's back and forth and you can hear people slap the water behind them because when you get your wrist involved. So that also helps to keep it in line and and stop that thing from going way back here, because if you're carrying that extra heavy line and stuff like that, the rod's going to want to do a little more of that. Um, I tell people you know 10 and 2 used to be the standard like when i read my first fly fishing book it was 10 and 2 and i tell people high noon you want to throw that up in the air and with that second hand technique you can stop it really high and point it up in the air so i want to talk about that rainbow scenario you just described One of the things that I've focused on on my casting, I don't know if this is right or not, (laughs) but I've (laughs) I've thought of it this way, and I think it's helped my casting, is if this is my rod tip, I'm putting my finger up in the air, right? Mm -hmm. And like you said, if I go 10 and 2, I'm creating an arc. You can see it along the brim of my hat, right? Mm -hmm. And instead, when I cast, I try to concentrate on pushing my rod forward and backward, from my elbow and shoulder and mm-hmm. like you said not breaking my wrist and if you notice when i do that my fingertip stays in the same plane is that the correct casting methodology is i really want it to create a tighter loop if i keep my tip of my rod my line is going to follow where my tip of my rod is right mm, yeah right so if i open my arc then my my loop gets bigger. I, I just mm-hmm. want to make sure I'm thinking about that correctly. And is that that that's exactly correctly? Okay. Um, a good technique to be able to do that is instead of casting in the air, drop the rod over to the side, and then do quick cast, but stop and let the line drop to the ground. Okay. So you'll see if it's got a big arc to it, or if you've got that tight loop. Mm-hmm. So you can cast it drop it it'll show you your loop cast it drop it it'll show you your loop okay and then that's also a good way to keep your rhythm because here you can't really see it but over here right you can see how your rod is traveling yeah and it's funny you say that because the few times i've taken i have two young girls and said hey let's i want to help you guys with your cast 
I have done that. I've held the rod sideways and I said, just whip your line back and forth. You know, mm -hmm. I want you guys to do that. Okay. You see how, if you go from one side to the other, like a circle, it's going to make a big long loop and to swing way out there. And then I say, okay, now just go back and forth. See how that changes. And you have very little line. Out. I mean, very little. Mm -hmm. And you can start to see that because you, you can't, it's for, for them to try and do it and look back at their line and extend and then come forward. It's like a mm -hmm. whole nother world of, you know, visuality and uh, turning your body and all those different things. It's so much harder. So I, I like that tip too. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also when you're casting in your back cast, like, there's no reason you can't turn your head. People are so focused on forward. Turn your head and because that timing, like letting your line unroll. I used to call it the three dollars. I used to call it two dollars snap, but uh, flies aren't two dollars <laughs> yeah. anymore. So I call it a three dollars snap now. But I would tell my students every time you crack the whip, like there's three dollars, and you definitely need to check your line because you came forward too fast. So. Um, if somebody's used to throwing a baseball or casting a spinning rod, it's all about that huck, yep. right? And and it's more. I called it starting a lawnmower. You know, you want to go, you want to start slow, but you want to accelerate, but you can't rip that thing hard or it won't start. So you want to be able to let that line unroll. We're supposed to be relaxing when we're fly fishing, right? right? right, right. So just give give it a second, pause, yeah. take a minute. <laughs> and the lawnmower description is really good. You do, you start slow, you go fast, but there's also a very hard stop at the end, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, yes. you, you can't just keep going. Um, otherwise, it's... You, you, <laughs> So your your cast has to be like that too. Like that. Let's um we're we're uh, coming up on some time here, so I want to keep <laughs> keep things going. Um, let's talk about saltwater. There are some the big scenarios that we deal with in saltwater are one wind, mm -hmm. two speed to cast, and three usually some kind of distance because the water clarity is so hot, so good. So yeah, let's talk about overcoming some of those things and w what you you utilize there. Well, the first thing I would tell my students when you're going on a saltwater trip and like I've had every guide tell me if you can't cast 60 feet, like it's not worth coming. You got to at least be able to get that. I find the average person can cast 30 to 40 just fine, but they, they need to tighten those loops down. So one of it is hauling. Mm -hmm. And I know everybody wants to do that. But once again, a good learning technique for hauling is drop that rod tip to the side haul it while you go backwards and let the line go and let it slip out, let it drop to the ground. So instead of trying to take that whole connection up, haul, drop, haul, drop. And that way, when you're doing your back cast, you can do a haul and then you can learn the double haul. Mm -hmm. The other thing for salt water is make sure you're shooting line in the back, not just forward, because then you can get your extra distance. Right. Because carrying, I mean, I can carry 60 feet in the air. It's not a good technique. <laughs> so if you can start with that 20 foot of line, you can throw back and give yourself an extra 10 or 15 feet and then shoot another 10 or 15 feet in the forward cast. You've got your cast. Your with cast only, is there. You know, yeah, you're there with only two casts rather than six, six. <laughs> casts, and then it starts to drop behind you, and that's how you get a and you a get a, you in get the a back gust, of the head. <laughs> you get a gust of wind, and all those other scenarios. So that that is something I'd like to focus on. One of the things that I, well, first of all, you hit it right on the head. You got to have your cast. The only way you're going to have your cast is you got to go practice before your trip. Mm, it's a different yes. rod. It's a different line. It's all those scenarios. It's so worth it if you're going to invest in it going on the trip. I mean, even yeah. if it's only three times for 15 minutes, it's worth it. You wouldn't go to the golf course and not warm up. So don't yeah. don't do it on your fly trip. Ah. Yeah. Pet well, you have a driving range, right? You don't practice on the golf course. Right, That's right. the most frustrating time <laughs> right. to practice. So what I was going to get to is one of the things I really like to do is to – like you said, break my cast down so that I practice looking forward and shooting line behind me and just mm -hmm. let it shoot. I let go of the line. I, I know that's not a, a technique that you want to use on the water, but I'm just practicing my haul, my backwards haul and shooting my line. A lot of times I'll use a ring loop on my finger to feel how much line is shooting. 
and then stop it mm-hmm. so I'm, I can feel that momentum that I'm definitely shooting line, but warming up like I got shooting line, shooting line. Okay. I think I shot 10 feet. Okay. Let me see if I can shoot 20 feet of line, mm-hmm. you know, et cetera. Yeah. Cause it, it's uh, you, like you said, I've always been told um, by some really good anglers uh, that are guides, et cetera. When I go to saltwater is you got to have a one, two cast and drop. If you mm-hmm. want to be really successful in, in saltwater, it's throw your fly one, two and drop. That's it. Or one, two, three, drop. You know, that's like as far mm-hmm. as you want to go. Anything beyond that, you're you're just you're taking your propensity to be successful and just <laughs> it's like a, a downward curve that is so steep, you know. So well I think people forget too, every time you false cast that thing, you're throwing line and you're just saying clear water, whether you're in a uh, river or whether you're in the salt water, the more things you have flying up in the air and the you have the chance to spook that fish, mm-hmm. the the yeah your opportunity drops. The other thing I would do in that salt water is that sidearm cast mm. because the less you can put it up in the wind, if you can bring it down low, like tighten your loops down so that they really can punch that wind. If you're doing that big rainbow cast, I mean, you're still getting 60 feet, but that fly has got all the time in the world to get blown around. Mm -hmm. So if you can tighten down your loops and then if you can bring it kind of sidearm, so you're not throwing it up in the higher gusts, that that helps you get that extra distance. Yeah, keeping it low and out of the wind. Um, Let's let's talk about that too, because there's two sidearm casts that, that I'm familiar with. There's a standard sidearm cast, but there's also a Belgian sidearm cast. Can you mm-hmm. talk about the, the differences between those and, and and maybe why you may utilize one over the other? Or... The Belgian cast, uh, kind of like I was talking about with the um, the two fly rig, split shots, all that stuff, It's a conti- that is a continuous cast so that you're picking it up and then allowing the line to swing over and and using so the belgian cast is a continuous cast Mm -hmm. can you just describe what what a belgian cast is because i don't know if if everybody knows i mean my understanding has always been when you're sidearm casting and you're you're kind of creating like a circular or an oval shaped loop Mm -hmm. etc to build momentum and it like you said it's continuous it's like you're you're winding that up to get that line speed um, et cetera, mm-hmm. versus a standard cast, which is your rod tip is single plane back and forth um, and not in a loop scenario. So it's on a, a singular line. Is, is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then no, you're not so much worried about the anchor point like you would with a roll cast. Um, I really like that with with the nymphs and streamers as well. If you can be able to, or the clouds are in saltwater, like you said, if you're able to not do that hard stop and you got a big old wet double streamer that bounces on your back cast because it stopped. Um, if you can do that continuous motion, you're able to load it. And it's also way easier on the arm, the shoulder on a full day of casting, you know, salt or streamer, you're mm-hmm. definitely wearing your arms out so anything you can take to to stop that shock would help in in my description of a belgian cast and i I may be calling the wrong name has always been um on a standard cast you're building you're stacking your loop over top of the line tip but in a belgian cast it's like you're stacking it on the right side and left side of your rod tip creating that oval Uh, is that do you see it that way in, in, as well? Yeah, I mean, I could see. So you're saying rod tip, line, line, uh, right? Like, yeah, so if I'm casting, yeah. you know, I have a sidearm cast, I'm bringing mm-hmm. my rod tip low, allowing the line to come over, and then I'm bringing my rod tip a little bit higher. And my loop is, it's vertical in nature, but it's it's on the top and bottom of my uh, rod tip yeah, uh, in correlation to the water, right? Because my, my rod tip is mm-hmm. parallel to the water versus yeah. a standard cast where if I was doing that, my rod would be parallel to the water, right? But mm-hmm. the loop would be off the tip of the rod. Um, 
you know, those, those are some of the things that I've utilized. I, it's different yeah. for different scenarios, but yeah, I, that's one definitely that I would take time to, to watch and practice with nothing on the hook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. yarn, yarn fly. Right, right, right. Um, I mean, that's another great way when you practice at the park is, you know, that yarn fly, you're not worried about hooking. So you can do some silly things with that because the Belgian can cross itself a lot yes. too. So, okay. um, but that, that continuous motion. And I think the more that you cast and understand kind of the plane at which the the line is traveling, whether it's that Belgian, like if I do this with my rod tip, if I make a big oval with it, like where is my line going to go and how is it going to follow it? Mm -hmm. It just makes you a better uh, line management for missing trees or, um, you know, not casting. Understanding wind scenarios, mm -hmm. how it's going to yeah. affect. Yep. Yeah. So the more that you add to it, uh, the better you can just under, understand where it's going to go. Right, yeah. So it doesn't matter. Your rod tip is high noon off to the side. You're dragging it through the water, all that good stuff. Yeah. yeah it's really understanding the mechanics of what, what your movement with the rod and, and whatnot, and how that's affecting the, the energy that's going to the line. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's, yeah. let's, uh, let's do this. We we talked about all those different water types. What are some of the commonalities that you see? Hey, look, if you worked on these two, three things, uh, it's going to transfer from area to area. Yeah, I would. My biggest thing when I fish with new people is is line management is probably the hardest time to be able to un understand where whether you're throwing a four foot cast or a sixty foot cast. I mean, even line management with, with stripping the line, right? Mm -hmm. Like under your feet is it going under the rod tip did it circle the reel as you were were doing it but a lot of it i mean the flies are are there but for the most part i mean if they're in the fly shop they've caught fish or they've caught a fisherman um <laughs> so just making sure that you're you're managing your line and you're understanding like how much where where is it going and stuff like that just to that that's probably the most common mistake that i see like people are um taking scenario one like you said i went to that rock i cast it behind it i always catch a fish there but you go to the next rock the current changed but you still do your same cast presentation because yeah. that's what you're you're doing so taking that moment to read your read your surroundings read your situation and um, understanding how to manage yeah. that. And, and we talk about that on the show all the time, situational awareness. It, it, everything that we learn as a new technique, it really helps build that situational awareness. And the more situational awareness you have, the more preparedness you have for each situation to be successful. So great, great yeah, descriptive some... word there. <laughs> Falls right yeah, in line with well, what we like to, to talk about here on the show. <laughs> well, and one of the things my friend and I always talk about, we do a frying pan trip every year. That's our first April. We go Easter and we go to the frying pan and there's six of us that go and there's two of us. My friend Michael is the only other guy that I that fishes with me and we talk about the same technique and don't blow people out of the way, the water with, you know, all the technical terms right. and stuff like that. But we realize that our flies are on the water three times more than everything else. It's because we've practiced our knots too. So if I tangle my rod tip and I just cut the whole thing off, I'm still rigged in a minute yes. and my line is back in the water. I'm also not tangling because I practiced my casting and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So my flies have three times more, more water time than all the other guys in the group. Yep. So by default, I catch more fish because I'm not wasting time on the banks trying to remember my knots. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great tip. Um, you know, you can't catch fish if your flies aren't on or in the water, and mm -hmm. uh, that refinement is uh, is pretty big. And it, people get caught up in I need to use this specialty knot and that specialty knot. The variability <laughs> in your success from one knot to the other is so minute. Use what you are competent in and can get done quickly. It's that. Yes. It's far, far more effective than 
having the particular knot that's going to have slightly less drag or be a little strong. You know, you know, let's yeah. get let's get out of the weeds. It's like the uh, the mentality of you got to match the hatch. You got to match the hatch. Mm. It doesn't matter if you match in a hatch if your fly's not in the water and it's not being presented to the fish. So sometimes yeah. you've got to take your head out of the water and just, you know, get a bug in their zone. You know, they're we hey, on Wednesday night. I don't eat Chinese every night. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes yep. I want a burger. <laughs> yeah. Even well, though that's what's cause... coming down the, the buffet. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, two years ago or three years ago, we went to that same frying pan trip and I happened to have a hopper dropper tied on from the previous season. And it was a nice sunny day, and I threw it. And on the frying pan, that's not supposed to work. But they hammered the hopper in early April when I'm sure there wasn't any yeah. anything going on. But they were happy to take a big, juicy thing on the surface. That's right. So we laughed about that the whole trip. Yeah, yeah. sometimes it just aligns. All right, we're going to wrap it up. You had some, um, you know, how to continue your learning curve uh approaches that you utilize and um let's just cover that in the next you know three to five minutes real quick for for the group i thought you had some really good tips there yeah so each season i've taken an opportunity to learn something different i mean early mm -hmm. in my fly fishing career when i remember matching the hatch and i needed to know what a bwo was and i needed to know what a small black stone fly and all the technical terms, I would go to the river with an entomology book, flip over rocks, and I would take some of my fishing time, relaxing time to just identify bugs, realize what's in the water. Um, one of my seasons was Euro nymphing, mm -hmm. and I really, I tried different leaders, I tried different techniques, but the trick is you got to leave the other stuff at home because you're going to want to default to what you do. When I far started fishing streamers, like I had no confidence in a woolly bugger mm -hmm. and I, I finally had to leave the hopper dropper back in the car. I took the streamer rod and, you know, learning those techniques and learning that because that's something that you can take into every, every aspect. I mean, you don't need a Euro rod to Euro nymph. You need a heavy fly and a tight line. So you can take your five weight and tight line it and get rid of that indicator mm. But that also gives you an opportunity to fish different water, different stuff. I mean, you can take all these different techniques casting. I mean, that's where I learned the S-Men. That's where I, you know, did record-breaking uh, distance casts and stuff like mm -hmm. that. As I took one summer to just read casting books and watch casting videos. And I took a lesson with Simon Galsworth on the river to do the two-handed spay and stuff like that. So in this season is I'm learning to row a boat and teach people to fish at the same time yep. or teach people to row a boat while I'm fishing, which is a whole new learning experience for me. But I, I'm enjoying almost guiding out of the, the boat. Mm -hmm. I mean, just because it's how can I position the boat, but then I'm reading the water. Right. Like when I first started guiding, it was I would stand where I thought the fish where, where I would want to fish. Right. And then I realized I have to step back at the client has needs to, to stand, stand, there, right. <laughs> stand there. So it took me a minute to uh, get that in line. But if you take those opportunities to just learn the, the different techniques, and that's something you can take every time. And I like expanding, expanding the knowledge yeah. and, and learning something new. Yeah. Well, Adam, um, it, it's been great having you on the show um, real quick. If you guys want to get a hold of Adam, flyriverdesigns.com. That's flyriverdesigns.com. Um, and, you know, I just want to touch on a couple of those last things that you talked about. Rowing a boat. I think it's an absolutely great way to up-level your fishing because you, as the rower, are managing the drift for the, the, the angler. Mm. So learning how to read a drift and anticipate this is the water that's coming up. This is where I need to be positioned to put them in the right drift. It's it's very effective for you to learn. And if you're fishing and not rowing, talk to your rower about that. 
especially if you're on a guided trip. Hey, what are you doing to help me with my drift and why? And start to understand that. And that'll make you a better angler from a boat too, because you'll start to understand and anticipate what they're doing to set you up. So a lot of times a guide will say, we're not going to fish this water. We're mm -hmm. going to skip it because we want you to be set up for that next. You see that next uh, flat area up there with the seam in it? We want you to fish that. That's the good water. We're going to just skip this. Hold your rod tip up. Get your bug out of the water. Get ready. You know, that kind of stuff. So that's a great one. And then the other one that I think is a misconception too, Adam, and you, you, um, have probably heard this is people think about, Oh, I'm going to go casting. I'm going to really work on my casting. And they think they got to have a big rod and be ready for salt water and really to make their 60 foot or 90 foot cast. You could do that with a five weight rod mm -hmm. or a four weight rod. In fact, there's very few people that can cast 90 feet with a five weight rod. So if you practice with that, imagine what you'll be able to do with a bigger rod, etc. as well. It's all about loading the rod, having the right technique and utilizing the, the tool in your hand with your technique. So um, Adam, it was great having you on the show. I learned a ton. Um, I'm looking forward to my casting lesson. Um, I don't know if I'll be breaking records like you, but uh, I, I sure hope so. <laughs> hey, that's, uh, there's always something to learn. That's right, man. Great to have you on the show. Uh, we'll catch all of you next week, and uh, I hope you enjoyed our tips. We'll see you.